Yeah, so uh, just to put some perspective, I'm, I'm a, a economist at, at Cambridge and with a, a bunch of other academics at Cambridge, we uh, had enough of, of being frustrated with the existing publishing model and, and, and thought we needed to do something. So what we decided to do was to set up an open access publishing company uh, publishing monographs and we'll have a little, in, little bit more detail in a second. <clears throat> so it's with that hat that I'm here with this uh, looking at open book publishers. Uh, just a little tiny bit of background um, and you know it's open access, it's online. So I really do encourage any of you who uh, want to trawl while I'm talking, um, you know, go online, have a look at the website and I'd really like you know, if you've got any thoughts or feedback and things like that, it's always very um, gratefully received. But I took a screenshot, rather than try and do this live, I'd seen a couple of presenters previously um, fighting between the two, and I thought, you know what, I'll just do everything with screenshots. So anyway, it's all screenshots. Um, uh, so this is, that's the sort of um, uh, homepage. A couple of things to, to, to point out from it. Um, so at the bottom there, um, we've got... So far, we've published about 118 titles. We've been going about 10 years now. Um, <clears throat> we've got about one and three quarter million book visits uh, for those titles in that time. Uh, and it's a, it's a global audience that's coming through. So uh, uh, it, it really, you know, Google Analytics says that there's 217 countries. Uh, you know, I don't think there's only about 180 uh, in the world. So I don't know quite how Google Analytics does it, but anyway. There's quite a few that have come through, and you look at those um, analytics maps, alas, uh, North Korea is still white, so we don't seem to have got anyone from North Korea, but otherwise it's pretty green. Um, uh, so um, all the books are, are open access. Now, what does open access mean? Mostly it means CCBY, so most of our books are CCBY. Not all of them can discuss about it. Uh, there's some that are NCND, and we can we can talk about these various licenses uh, if anybody's interested. And just as part of the, uh, just to point out, we don't charge authors a, a a publishing cost. So there's no there's no um, compulsory charge there. Uh, we do ask um, for them to apply for grants if there's they're aware that and he's there, but there's no compulsory um, payment, so it's not part of the decision process. Um, just quickly, we're, we're a non-profit community interest company that we set up just to, to, to make sure. What we were concerned about was that uh, the good quality, you know, it's a standard thing. I'm pushing against an open door here, but good quality, op uh, good quality research, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, wasn't being made publicly available because it was behind the paywall. So that's what we were trying to address. So presently, we're publishing about 24 titles um, a year. Um, we primary pub primarily publish peer-reviewed research. Uh, and you'll see one on that I hope will all interest you and immediately go in and have a look. Uh, in fact, many of you might have been contributors to this, so uh, uh, there's a few nodding heads around the audience, so thank you very much. And, uh, uh, but um, th it's those sorts of works that we're looking to publish, really good quality, highest quality research monographs. We have a very rigorous peer review process, and it's very, very, it's the only traditional part of our model we really, really want to be publishing work whose alternative outlets would be the very top university presses. That's the level that we're looking for. Um, okay, uh, but amongst those 118 titles, there are 10 open access textbooks and five works that were created as part of a, a student uh, and, and coursework uh, process. And it's those that area that I want to look at uh, now and, and, and think about uh, some of the issues around the open act, uh, the textbooks and then the, the course content that we've published. Um, okay, so the textbooks, uh, uh, we've got 10 OA textbooks. Three of them are based, uh, are targeted at university level. Uh, two of them at the bottom there in classics, which are published in conjunction with Dickinson College in the US. Uh, and there's a big website that backs the, with those publications. Uh, one of them is in economics, uh, and we've published seven titles now, which are targeted specifically at the UK A-level students, specific courses and structures within the UK um, A-level. And again, this is primarily where I want to be um, thinking for the talk now. 
At the top, we've got one on ethics, which is targeted specifically at the philosophy and religious studies courses in and, and, and A-level. We've got a, a, a one on mathematics, uh, which is targeted at the STEP examination here, which is the mathematics exam that sits above A-level for people going through to study mathematics. And we've, uh, we've got five in classics, uh, all targeted, and you probably can't read, but this is like Tacitus, a particular um, segments from these works, and those segments correspond to the assigned texts from the uh, uh, ancient civilization course for A-level. So these are really, really specifically targeted at A-level courses. Uh, this is, is, would be the sort of the homepage for these, and I'll just quickly, briefly show you what, what happens there. We've got uh, free editions. Uh, we've got a, a PDF reader, online PDF reader. There's HTML. There's uh, PDF, which is free to download. Uh, we also have some EPUBs, Mobis, which we're charging for. And we've got paper and hardback editions, which, again, we charge for. And we can talk about the, why we do that, et cetera, later if anybody's interested. But the, the free editions uh, um, of our textbooks are like that. On the more recent books, we've also got XML, which can be downloaded for free as well. Uh, we have a facility uh, called OBP Customized, which allows anybody to come in and customize the title uh, that can be mixed and matched across ourselves or other content can be brought in. And uh, we can republish that uh, as, as um, whoever wants. So that, that facility is there. Uh, I've got. The, on, on all the titles, there's a viewing statistic. Uh, and so here, in, in this case, it's saying viewed uh, just over 43,000 times. And there's a little details button there that, that if anybody's interested can go through, and it gives a much more detailed breakdown of where the, the book has been visited. So by a book visit, I mean somebody's gone to the PDF reader, downloaded uh, the PDF, gone to the HTML. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in, in a, in a second. Um, and... Uh, and then, and then finally, for these classics books, uh, and this is one of these reuse components, where open access is not just about free to read, but it's free to reuse. And so here is a situation where uh, there is, in the classics community, there's a, there's a, a, a group, uh, a website uh, called the Classics Library, which is a huge, wonderful resource which, where teachers are sharing their content. And the uh, Stephen Jenkins, who's the... the, the the, who runs that said, could he upload these books through a WordPress site onto, onto the Classics Library? So here is the version of that uploaded onto there. And of course, along with that comes commentary functions and the ability for teachers to come in and supplement or complement the work, in some cases adding videos that complemented it, in some and, and, and other cases comments and clarifications and things like that. So here's, here's a really reuse example where the book's been picked up and it's been put up onto another website and engaged with, with the broader teacher community. So I want to think a little bit, and we'll come back to that, because this, this for us, an, an important uh, what we're recognizing is that that level of engagement is hugely important for the uptake and the use of the work. It needs, to be com it needs to be coming into a community. It's no good just us putting up stuff and saying, look at CCBY. You know, one's got to connect it as well. And, people have, and, and so that's something which uh, one, of the, one of the reasons really and excitement of being here is to think about how this high quality content, what could or should we be doing, not just with textbooks, but more generally, to increase the engagement and the reuse of the work. Because that is a really important power of what CCBY provides. So here's uh, usage stats for the seven textbooks. So these are, again, all A-level textbooks. And you can see that, this, that the online readership um, is, you know, in the, in the, the 40s of thousands. Uh, now, you know, student enrollment for these courses is quite small in the, you know, one, one and a half thousand. So there's a lot of engagement going on here. Um, uh, and if we break that down a little bit, um, we've, we've aggregated, to talk about usage statistics, we've aggregated statistics from the, a number of different platforms that we're aware of which are hosting this work. So you can see, actually, the Classics Library is a huge source of traffic for this work. So it's really, really been important. That upload by them, third party, 
upload, reuse of it, has been hugely important for the engagement of this work with, that, with, with the community. We've got our own o, um, OBP uh, um, PDF reader, HTML reader, PDF downloads. Google Books is sitting there. Again, another important source of traffic across all our areas. The discovery and use of those works on Google Books has been important. Open Edition is a, a primarily French platform. And I've got World Reader. It's a little tiny percentage in this particular case. Um, uh, but World Reader is, is, a, is a wonderful um, service providing uh, 2G technology for reading books uh, through Africa um, so that they can be read on mobile telephones. Now, you try and read a textbook <laughs> on a 2G, you know, it's a pretty miserable reading experience. The fact that people are engaging and doing it shows how much need there is because, you know, if there was any other option, they wouldn't be choosing to read it on 2G. By country, you can see there are classics books, primarily the United Kingdom. I've got to look at the time. Um, United Kingdom uh, dominates, as you'd expect. These are targeted for the, for the UK audience. But you know, the US is quite large there. Uh, we've got another, 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 you know, quite a lot of uh, the rest of the world which is engaged with these works one way or another, presumably not because they're sitting A-level exams uh, in June. Uh, and so, and the United States, and we'll come back to this in a second, to some, uh, the things like the uh, Open Textbook Initiative, I think have been important in bringing the work and, and making it available uh, in, in, in some of these other um, audiences as well. Okay, um, I just wanna compare that with the ethics textbook. So the ethics textbook is, again, very, very targeted at the syllabuses um, at A-level. And actually, the, the stats are really dramatically different here. In fact, it's the United States that has picked up on that. So what I should say is that these books, because they're very high-level books for a school level, they're actually also being adopted at, at, at the first-year university level in the US. And so what we're seeing here is that actually that ethics book, and again, I suspect it's because of things like the... Uh, the uh, Open Textbook Initiative, that those are being made aware and, 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 and teachers are engaging with them and recognising those works and beginning to adopt them. So that, that, that's a higher proportion than the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, we, I, I think in, on reflection, we probably haven't connected to that teacher community as well as we did with the classics works. Uh, and that's something you know, that we now need to go away and, and, and really think about is and, and any advice would be warmly welcomed. How do we engage with that, that same community for the ethics as we were doing with the classics? Because it's looking like we're not quite making that hit here as we could have been doing. Okay, um, if we add to these stats our, our sales data, one begins to get some process towards a business model here. So you can see that on the whole, sales have been around the 1,000 mark, 1,000, 2,000. Um, now that's we're, we're we're very happy and comfortable with that. So it it costs us about three and a half thousand, four thousand pounds to produce the book, and then with some overheads on top of that, we would need to be covering about five and a half thousand, five thousand pounds, something like that, to cover our average costs. So if we're making, uh, if our markup is at around six pounds a book, something like that, we we're going to need to make sales of about eight hundred to 1,000 to really start breaking even. And we're doing that with these textbooks. So that's something that I would just want to put down here is there is a business model here that can sustain the production of this content uh, through the sale of the printed works. If we look, <coughs> I've got down the side, if, if we've got uh, the conversion rates down there, you know, you know, you guys are used to digital marketplaces. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon to have conversion rates at about one and a half, two percent when one's got free content and one's trying to sell premium content on there. If you look at our, our, our model in the same way, then we've got the free versions and we're trying to sell the paper versions to, 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 to cover our costs. These conversion rates are high in that sort of online world if you put it in that online area. So people do want printed versions of free open access textbooks. And there is a business model there to be able to sustain that. That's, a, that's able to sustain it in classics. <laughs> now, classics doesn't have the biggest student base. So, you know, in some of the subjects that have a much bigger student base, uh, it, there's, there's clearly more potential there. Okay, so just quickly summarizing um, so that bit as far as uh, OA textbooks are concerned, um, we're getting a lot of readers. 
there's a lot of engagement with the work at the readership level, relatively high conversion rates. It looks like there's a sustainable business model there. We, um, uh, in, well, engagement with, uh, with teachers and third parties um, uh, and platforms, I think, is really, really important and something that we are really looking to work on and think about how to develop because that's really how the work starts getting a life of its own, is through that sort of engagement. Um, you know, any advice, any thoughts about how we could be doing that better would be, you know, really welcomed. Um, at to, to date, we've had very little use of the OBP customised. Uh, and, and what use we've had has not really been structural changes, it's been more cosmetic changes. Uh, and so, so thinking about how people would engage with the content to redevelop it, to take it, to own it, to use it for their own purposes, that's something that we haven't yet seen and we're thinking about how to push that through. Um, uh, clearly, um, th things like the open textbook libraries, Google Books, these big platforms of discovery are clearly very, very important. Um, as far as some of the difficulties are concerned, the, the open access, the textbook market in the UK is sewn up by a very cosy relationship between the examination boards and their publishing partners. Uh, and so some of the difficulties that we face is that the examination boards give accreditation stand, status to sp specific, um, uh, specific providers. Presumably there is some money transfer that goes one way or another, it is associated with that. And in some cases, um, teachers don't feel obliged to take the accredited one because they feel that you know that that's the one that will prepare the students the most. So there's this there is there is a very very cozy relationship that's that's developed, and I think you know I would really encourage as a movement we don't have that K twelve movement in the in the same way here as we as as we've seen in the U S. And thinking about how to break that relationship and to free that relationship up, I think is really really important. Um, so, for example, the timing of the course content, the actual, I, I said that many of those classics books were targeted at specific texts. Those texts are known by the, by the examination board, I, I think about 18 months beforehand, um, and, uh, uh, but they're not released to the teachers or to anybody except the, 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 um, the private partner that they've made until about nine months before. So to get those books together, you once got to scamper fast, which is not a good way of doing things. So an easy win would be just to say, ask them to make that announcement another year earlier and give the teacher community um, and, and the academic community time to develop the resources for it. Uh, and finally, just I've been given a three minute warning and these are gonna be long minutes. I'll talk very fast and it'll spend, extend. Um, uh, commissioning content. Uh, we've got a business model that, that, that covers costs. We do offer authors royalties. Not all of them take it, but we do offer royalties to authors. Uh, and the royalties are in the low thousands. Now, that's not enough to buy you out a job to go and write a book. So if you, one's going to do commissioning, one's got to think more carefully. Or one's got to think if one's going to have a systematic provision of open access resources, we've got to have another way of coordinating teachers to make sure that we are always providing the content as required. So some sort of coordination device is required to be attracting and assigning, um, assigning works. But there's lots of authors out there who want to do this, not for money, but because they believe in education. And, and so harnessing those is, 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 you know, potent would be valuable. I've got two and a half minutes left. Uh, one minute, I'm told. Okay, I just want to talk qu quickly about the other part of it, which is we've got three works that were created as part of the, of the teaching environment. So the first of these was a, was a translation of Dennis Diedrow's Ramu's Nephew. Uh, it's a beautiful translation by two uh, Oxford academics, uh, Kate Tunstall and, and, and Caroline Warman. The editor wanted to have a lot of uh, biographical and musical footnotes because there's a lot of references that present readers might know. And so they worked with uh, Pascal Duc at uh, the Conservatoire in, in Paris and recorded as part of the, of the program for the musicians and the recorders and the directors and, and as part of a student 
program was to create 14 tracks for that, which we've then embedded in the book, and I do have the book, but you know, embedding music into paper is, is difficult, but we've just got little QR codes so that you can play it on your, on your telephone. Um, but of course, all the digital ones, it's all embedded in there. And all that music has been created CCBY, so it can be uploaded, it hadn't been recorded before most of this. So that's one example. Then Caroline Warman, you'll see there, went on and uh, worked with an with a anthology of, of um, works from the Enlightenment about tolerance. Now, this was in a direct response to the Charlie Hebdo attack in, in, in Paris. And uh, the French um, 18th century uh, French literary uh, society brought out a pamphlet of Enlightenment writings about tolerance. Caroline Woolman saw that and said we should translate it. She took it back and made it and assigned it as the translation course for the second year French students in Oxford. So 100 students plus their tutors then spent the first term translating this work, which was brought out then in time for the first year anniversary in the January 2016. Uh, it was then released then. So this was hugely, this was a huge engagement, all the students really engaging in, in this, and, and I think it was a very productive uh, educational experience for, for all involved. And of course it got picked up by all the newspapers, so the Guardian and the BBC and things like that, it all started reporting about how Oxford students were responding to the Charlie Hebdo Hebb attack. So it was a very positive experience, I think, for all involved. Uh, so much so that it inspired one of her colleagues to do a similar thing uh, about anthologies about the idea of Europe for in the Enlightenment. Um, all, again, in this case, targeted, it came out in three different languages, in English, German, and, and French, uh, and it was, the releases were targeted for the elections. There was a, you know, the national elections in France and in Germany, and there was a Brexit vote here that some of you might remember. And so this was brought out in, 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 in time for those to try and bring through and reinforce what the underlying concept of Europe was. In a way, it was a coordinated effort across a bunch of universities and students across Europe to try and reinforce the very, the very, very processes that they were doing. Again, an extremely powerful learning process for, for all, all those involved. Okay, um, uh, minus one minute, so I'm talking backwards. Uh, uh, but uh, um, some, some quick lessons here. You know, students do wonderful things if you give them good tasks and good direction. Uh, the second is that it's catching. Once you've done it, you want to do it again because it works so well. Um, the, all of those projects worked really well because the primary academic behind it was deeply engaged with it. And their credibility and their academic rigor was going to be lying on the final work. And I think that was really important. It really engaged the students because there was deep involvement by the academics involved. And of course, in this day and age, if you're going to get academics to put that much effort into it, you've got to reward them. And so there needs to be some recognition system for that type of process in the, pr in the promotion um, structure. Caroline Woolman was awarded the Teaching Excellence, uh, Teaching Engagement Award at Oxford because of the work that she'd done on the tolerance um, volume. Okay, so that's it. Um, there's some contact details for both Open Book and for me. And a quick plug, um, the person who creates all our digital content is uh, going back to Italy and we're looking for another one. So any, any, anybody who knows anybody who wants to work doing that sort of thing, please tell them to get in touch. Uh, such a fantastic presentation, Rupert. Thank you very much for sharing all that uh, with us. Lots to take away about open textbooks, about open uh, business models. Again, I'm inspired that there are people out there that are making, creating and sharing open content their actual job and uh, paying the bills with it. I think this is incredibly encouraging. Um, so despite you almost self-censoring yourself as regards timing, we've got plenty of time for questions. So do please, um, if there's anybody in the audience who has got a question that they would like to ask, please raise your hand. Uh, right at the back there. I c I'm afraid I can't see who that is. I'm sorry if you could start with letting us know your name and uh, where you're from. It's Anna Komasquin. I'm from the Open University. 
Hello. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the translation initiatives that you have presented at the end, and what was the cost of getting those books published through your company um, for the teachers or for the institutions, and how was that funded? Uh, so, as far as the direct publishing costs, was about the same as the others. In fact, we ended up doing quite a lot more work because we put uh, links through to the original content. So, so the translations were there, but then within OBP, we then linked it back to the original content so you can travel from there. So there was a little bit more work in there, so it was probably a little bit more expensive than what I was saying, but it's in the, in the, in the order of about 4,000 uh, pounds. It cost us to be able to uh, produce those works. Um, as far as uh, what the, uh, again, what, what we've got is a model that says if you have grants, then please apply for them. Um, uh, I think that we got a grant, uh, but I, I, I can't remember if it was a full grant or not. I probably should know. Um, from the 18th century uh, um, French Literature Society that put some money in. Um, uh, so I, there were there were contributions that came through, uh, but I, I I would have to check whether they were full contributions or not. But it's that sort of order. What we we you know we just ask for people to apply for whatever they can, um, and you know we take <laughs> whatever we can. Uh, you know, but if it's a hundred pounds, we say thank you very much. If it's a thousand pounds, we still say thank you very much. If it covers the whole cost, we still say thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, but it's not a require. It's not part of the. You know, we're not saying we will only do this if you come up with some money. Um, thank you. I, I, I mean, I, I guess I could just say there's three strands to our business model. The one is those grants that comes about a third of our net income comes from that. We get about a third of our net income from the sales of printed works, and we have a library membership scheme that libraries, academic libraries, join up to. It cost, it's about 300 pounds a year. Uh, there's some benefits that go with that, but that supports also what we do, and that's about a third of our income stream as well. Um, have we got any further questions from the floor? It looks like people are realising that the bar is in fact open. Um, I, however, have a final question. Have you come across the work of Martin Eve at Open Lib Hums? And Absolutely. do you work with those guys? Yes, yes, we, we, we do. At, at present, um, uh, the Open Library of the Humanities um, is not uh, doing books. Uh, they have a, 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 originally when they set up, and I'm not sure if the plan has changed, um, it was to involve four publishers in book publishing. Um, of which one of them was us. And in fact, we've published a book by Martin Eve. So one, one of our works is, is by him. So uh, um, uh, yes, uh, fantastic. You know, exactly you know, the community that we need to be building and, 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 and working with. Yeah, there's a, um, a lot of really encouraging work in open access and in open publishing, especially in the uh, humanities, the social science, where the research culture is around the monograph. But, um, I'm just rambling and asking my own questions. I could very easily do this in a different room and let you guys go. So I'd like once again to thank Sam and to thank yourself uh, uh, for two excellent and inspiring talks to close the conference on. So thank you very much for that. Can we uh, the usual way? Uh, we've now got a short...